Okay, we are recording. Hello, hello. Welcome to Friday Blue. Friday with the Library in the Blue Box is the main page. And this is John St. Clair. He is an awesome author. And I've read his debut novel, and he is amazing. He started his career, career as a novelist after spending 25 years battling fraud and abuse in the cyber realm. He lives with his amazing wife, Nancy, in the northern Virginia suburb. Stalin's Door is his favorite no his debut novel. I don't know what his favorite novel is, but is it? It could, it could be my favorite novel. Okay. I, my background <laughs> is being aggravating. There we go. I can sneak it up. <laughs> There we go. Uh, pretty cool. There it is. Isn't it pretty? It is I posted pretty. pictures everywhere and I reread it as fast as I could in the last few days. Wow, nice. Thank you. And I've even laminated the little card because oh, cool. Mr. Chewy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Welcome and thank you so very much. Okay. Is there anything you'd like to say about yourself or introduce? No, I'm, I'm, uh, well, I mean, if you've never met me before, then obviously, uh, you're coming in cold. So I'm an author, uh, at the moment, and I do have a debut novel, and it is entitled Stalin's Door. And my name is John St. Clair, and I do live in, uh, Virginia. And I'm very, very happy to be here, uh, doing this interview. I think we're going to have a bunch of great questions. Um, just be cognizant. I think there's a 40 minute limit on this, uh, Zoom. Okay. So if you want to just keep an eye on the time, because I've been on these Zoom calls before and they just cut you off. There's no. There's no okay, warning. we will try to so. fit everything in the next 38 minutes. <laughs> yes. Okay, let's start with no what worries. sparked you to write a story about Russia and do all the oh um, stuff involved in finding out how it works. Well, you might think that uh, being a new writer uh, that uh, diving straight into Russian historical fiction might not have been the, the smartest or easiest or, or most fun way to, to, to kick off my writing career, but that's exactly what happened. Russian historical fiction is, is what chose me, uh, I would say, because of the subject matter that I was interested in writing um, that sort of shunted me into that uh, esoteric uh, genre, so to speak. And uh, yeah, it's great. I think it's uh, I think it's pretty cool. I'm I know a lot of authors, a lot of writers at all levels, and I can honestly say I don't know anyone that's written in the Russian historical fiction genre. So I think that's pretty cool for me because I've got something that's You're unique. The first that one, not offer. for me. Yeah, first first one, first one for a lot of people. First one for me writing it. Um, fascinating uh, genre, and not something I would have expected. Uh, had you asked me a few years ago, I would have said science fiction or or maybe mystery or I don't know something like that. Uh, something that I'm more accustomed to reading. Hadn't done a lot of uh, Russian historical fiction uh, reading, and uh, really delved uh, right into the research. I mean, this is something that is necessary because I'm not yes. Russian. I don't speak Russian. I've never visited Russia, and I certainly didn't live in the time period that I write in. So all uh, right then and there, being a, an historical fiction author, I had to go heavy into the research. And I spent years, literally five years, uh, doing all that research so that I could tell something that was as authentic as possible. And uh, I have gotten many good uh, comments and feedback. And while I don't personally know any Russians um, or Russians that lived in that time period that I'm writing for, uh, the, the ones that have read it have uh, complimented me on the diligence of the research that I've done. And I think that's uh, a, a, a tremendous reward as an author to, 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 to hear, hey, you, your stuff it, it sounds and reads as authentic as it, as it can be. Now, of course, it is fiction, but it's, it's set in a period that is well known. You can read about it. Um, this, this, you know, the events that, that are, you know, uh, transpiring around the characters really happened. So this is not uh, historical fantasy, which is uh, something that's based on uh, a time period or an event or something, but everything is made up. The, the, the characters are fictional, but the uh, the circumstances and the events are, are very real. Yes, the, the depth that I saw and how far you went 
for the descriptions and what was happening was amazing. Do you, you plan so to write more in, of historical fiction in Russia or anywhere else? Oh, uh, no, probably not. Not not at least for the time being. <laughs> it's not the uh, it's not on and it likely won't be the one that I'm going to work on after that. I may come back to it in the future, but um, I think I'd like to move around to some other genres. And uh, I think this is neat. I, I always like to say that the, that the story picks me. I have nothing against uh, writing a series of books or, or having a, uh, you know, some sort of uh, niche uh, character that you always want to write for. I think those are great. Um, I, I just happen to, at this point in time, uh, I'm writing to the story. So my next story is not Russian historical fiction. And the one after that won't be, but maybe at some point in the future, I might come back to either historical fiction or possibly Russian historical fiction. Okay. Um, at any point during Zinnia's life or Lyra's or Sava's, would you like to hang out with them and which one and what would you do? Yeah, that's a great question. And for people that aren't familiar, there are three main characters in Stalin's story, Zhenya and Sava and Lyra. Uh, two are women and, and, and one is a man. And they're at various different ages um, within the novel. So I can write from different perspectives as uh, with regard to gender and their age. And to answer a question, which one I would like to hang out with? Well, of course, if you ask uh, an author who who is their favorite character. It's, I suppose it's maybe like having kids. Um, you can't really pick one or you're, or you're not supposed to. Um, for me, I think to answer this question, I probably would pick Lyra. Lyra is the uh, older too. woman. She's a grandmother. She's a character who's closest to my age. When the novel starts, she's 56 and I'm, I'm 53. So I probably identify with her more than any of the other characters. But I thought it was a challenge and I thought it was a nice um, way to write, uh, especially what I don't know, uh, writing characters at different ages and different genders and uh, in, in different cultural uh, uh, aspects. Um, as a writer, I, I, I really hope I did justice to, to all of those things and really tried to expand um, myself as a writer. Of course, they say write what you know, but at some point your, your life experiences are going to outrun your, your ideas. And so mm -hmm. I wanted to, I wanted to put myself in, in their shoes as best as I could. But, uh, but Lyra is, is probably the one I identify with the, the closest. Okay. Speaking of Sava, yes. another author has asked if you were ever in the Navy. I was not in the Navy. My, my brother, believe it or not, is in the military and my father was in the military, but I am not. And, uh, they're both in the air force. So, uh, not, okay. Uh, not from a naval background, not in the Navy currently. Um, I picked uh, that branch uh, specifically, and not to get a, uh, give anything away for folks that haven't read the book, but um, uh, Sava's brother was obviously uh, in the Navy too and died on a very famous battleship in the First World War. And that has ramifications that will play out in the novel um, mm -hmm. because of those events that sets a certain... Uh, chain reaction of things that happened to Sava uh, that, that will come to define his experiences in the book. And that only could have happened had he uh, served in the Navy uh, with his, uh, at the same time as his, that his brother did. And, and that was coming on the tail end of World War I. And, and again, this will make sense when you read the book, but that, that's why that branch was, was chosen. Okay. Um, in your pictures, Whenever you, you post a picture on Twitter and you say yes. in six words or fewer, mm -hmm. write a story. Why six words? Why six words? Um, I cannot claim to have started that. I saw that on Twitter, uh, some other author or some other page or someone else was doing that. And uh, I thought that was a neat way to drive engagement. I would uh, save pictures that I come across, interesting pictures, and there's, there's no theme if you've seen these, I've been doing these. Probably yeah, they're all every different day. pictures. Yeah, I've, I've, I'm probably coming up on six months um, 
that I've been doing this. I do it every day, weekends included, and I'll mm -hmm. pick everything, different, uh, different styles, different uh, time periods, different uh, subjects, just so something that interests me, something that's a, a neat or interesting or unique picture. And the six words, words or fewer means that anyone can instantly uh, write a story. That would be a very short story, obviously a micro uh, fiction, if you will. Mm -hmm. But six words or fewer keeps it short. Obviously, there's a character limit in Twitter mm -hmm. to begin with, but uh, anybody can write a six word story. Anyone at all. You're, uh, if you say that you're not a writer, write a six word story. Guess what? Now you're a writer. You know, go ahead and join in on that. I think it's great fun. It drives engagement for me as an author. And I think it's just something fun um, to do that takes maybe uh, a minute to, to participate in. Mm -hmm. And there's no wrong answer. Every story is different. It's, it's based upon what the author chooses to write. And uh, there's no judgment. I like all of the uh, answers, all of the stories that come in. And some of them are quite clever. And I may respond and, and, and reply and say, hey, that was really cool. But I do like uh, all of them that come in. Uh -huh. And I think it's just a neat thing um, that I'm doing. Again, I, I don't claim ownership. Uh, I encourage you, uh, if you're listening to this, uh, find a picture that interests you and you can post on Twitter and you can have folks that are friends of yours write their own six word stories or make it 10 words, but you can't make it too long because Twitter has a, a character limit. So I thought six words was just kind of a cool way to, to keep it short and simple. Oh yeah, definitely. Yep. Could you possibly give us, uh, give the world a look at Stargate nine? Okay. Stargate nine. And then, and again, I'm, I'm, not only am I repeating the question just to make sure that everybody understands what it is, but if you don't know me, I've done these author interviews before and I keep referring to this short story called Stargate Nine. The interesting thing about this story was I wrote it when I was eight years old. So I was, I think it was in the second grade, maybe third grade, but it was something like that. And it was obviously a long time ago and it was handwritten and it was in the uh, 1970s. And I wish that I had a copy of this. This is something that I remember writing fondly. It was, you know, a couple, three pages of, of, of text uh, that, I, that I hand wrote and I did it for some uh, assignment in whatever class I was in at the time. Probably uh, there was some kind of creative writing assignment or something. And I wish I had a copy of this story because I remember it fondly because it got good feedback and it was, it was pretty uh, daring, I think, for an eight-year-old to write some kind of hard science fiction like story. And I, I don't have a copy of this anymore. If I do, I don't know where it is. And I would surely love to, uh, to, to read it again because I do have fond memories of it. But um, in anticipation of this question, may, maybe I shouldn't read it again because then that might shatter the, uh, the illusion. So I, I look at it fondly, but maybe if I read it now, it's crap. And then it wouldn't be uh, as uh, fond anymore so maybe the fact that it is hidden or 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 uh, tucked away somewhere is a good thing because then i can remember it fondly and, and and tell people hey i wrote this story when i was eight years old and uh I, I think that's pretty cool but the world will take a look at it if i find it i wouldn't have no problem publishing that and say hey look, look at how far i've come in in in, in 50 years so okay <laughs> that would rock your next novel is Lucky Daniel or Danielle McElhenney. Will you tell yep. us a little bit about it? Yes, absolutely. So I've been working on a, uh, another book, obviously. Uh, I didn't want Stalin's Door to be my only uh, novel, although if that's all I've ever done in my life, I would still be very proud of that because that's... Uh, it is so that, worth being proud of. Most folks, exactly. Most folks uh, that, that say they want to write a novel, I think I read stat that 90... 3% never will or something like that, or only 7% will. It's some small fraction of the folks that are even interested in writing to begin with will actually go the entire distance to actually publish something. So the fact that I did that, if I do nothing else, I'm pretty proud of that. I think that's, that's pretty cool. But since I'm right at the moment, I think I need to see if I can repeat that and write something else and see if that's successful or maybe more successful or maybe it'll be less. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm working on... Uh, something new. It's nothing to do with the first one. It's not Russian historical fiction. It's literary fiction. It's uh, the, the working title, although I don't think it's going to change because I've already commissioned uh, artwork for the, <laughs> for the cover, which is crazy, um, but very inspiring. I did the same thing with, with Stalin's door. Uh, Lucky Daniel, and I believe it's pronounced because it's Irish, Daniel. It looks like Danielle or D Daniel um, is, is, I believe, how you pronounce that. And it's McElhenney. 
like the um, little uh, closely related to the uh, Tabasco product. Mm -hmm. I think that's McElhenney and this is McElhenney. Little different spelling, but I believe they're pronounced the same. But uh, it, it's a modern piece. I think it's probably going to be literary fiction because that's sort mm -hmm. of a non-descriptive genre. That's uh, if you don't have a subgenre like science fiction or mystery or horror or something like that. If it's just regular people and regular times and stuff like that, it's literary fiction. There's, there's no genre specific uh, that I can think of at the moment, but uh, it takes place in 2007. And there's this 20-something uh, kid, Lucky Dan, Lucky Daniel. And um, he's got all sorts of adventures and things that he's uh, uh, doing. And there's some of the local mob element in the, in the city of Boston where it takes place. And there's some crazy things that are going to happen. And I really, really want to tell the world about it. But I also want it to be a surprise. So I want to um... I want to kind of just tease my, my readers out there that this is what is being worked on and this will be my second novel but I don't want to get too much into it at the moment just because I, I do want to remain uh, uh make it a little bit of a mystery yes okay I definitely can guarantee that Nate and I will want to read it mm -hmm. okay appreciate that. appreciate that I've got a lot of folks asking yeah when's your next book coming out that will be the next one I just don't want to give a time um, I'm not factor. asking for a time. I just wanted no a tiny bit of a piece. I'll, I'll promise you this. I'll promise you this. Uh, it will be published before George R. R. Martin's sixth novel in the Song of Ice and Fire series. How about that? Great. So <laughs> hopefully at some point, period. Great. It will be at some point, which I can't say the same for George Martin's next book, but that's that's just me. <laughs> okay. What authors inspire you? What authors inspire me? Well, I have to say that uh, since joining the Twitter writing community, which I did in sort of a backwards fashion, I, I, I did all this research for this book. I took five years to write it and then I published it. And then I said, well, now what, you know, what, what, uh, what do I do now? Oh, wait, I have to market this thing because somebody's not just going to, you know, make it a bestseller. I have to go out and tell people about it. I was misinformed. I thought just hitting publish and that people would be beating down my door to, to read this. No, actually, it's a lot of work you have to do in uh, the marketing and all of the, 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 the self-promotion yourself as, a, as an independent author. And that's fine. That's, uh, it's, that's not a problem. But as an independent author, I don't have a, a publishing house behind me. I don't have a, a publicist and a, and, a, and a copyright editor and a you know, uh, publish. I, you know, I don't have any of that. I don't have a team. So I'm a team of one. So I discovered pretty quickly after publishing that there's this wonderful community on Twitter called the writing community. It's just all independent authors uh, like ourselves and uh, started interacting with them pretty quickly and uh, made a whole lot of uh, new friends that are uh -huh. authors like myself, which I think is great. So to answer your question, they inspire me. Um, They're awesome. They're, they're in the same position I am. They're, they're writing books on their own. They're, they're, they're trying to get the word out on their own. They're trying to, 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 to learn uh, from one another and not repeat uh, mistakes and uh, learn tips and tricks and things. And so in a roundabout way, it, those are the folks that inspire me. But if you want specific names, uh, there are two authors that started out as independent are very world famous now. They both have uh, books that they published independently that then got picked up by a uh, big, you know, five or six, I don't know what the names are, you know, these big publishing houses mm -hmm. that, that everybody's heard of. They got book contracts after they published their works independently. And uh, they both have, uh, one has a movie that's been out and one has a TV series that's coming out. And I'll give you the names. These are great guys. You should follow them on Twitter. Um, they did the route that I'm sure a lot of folks wouldn't mind taking, which is start independent, get so famous because everybody likes your book, it gets picked up by a you know big time publisher and then you get a movie deal out of it. So the one guy who's sort of the, the poster child for what I just said is Hugh Howey. Mm -hmm. He wrote the Wool series. It's coming out on Apple TV, which is like the his flagship you know uh, streaming series. Um, it's going to be huge. Uh, he sold, I don't know how many millions of copies of his, uh, of his work, but he was... Uh, I think he was working as a boat captain or something. He was doing charters or something. And he wrote yeah. this uh, short story called Wool. 
And then that got kind of developed into uh, five or six parts that he put together on a novel. Then he wrote two more novels in the world universe. And like I said, now he's got a science fiction series coming out on Apple and he's big time. So that that's a great success story because he went from independent author with nothing to having a show on Apple. Uh, the other author, um, which is who is just as famous, uh, Andy Weir wrote a, a little book called The Martian, did the same thing. Started out independently published, got picked up by a big time publisher and uh, then has a, a world famous movie with Matt Damon and all those other stars. And that's a great movie, by the way. It's a great book. I've, I've read that oh, many yeah. times. Uh, very successful uh, story. And both of these guys are really down to earth. They're very approachable. I've contacted both of them and gotten replies, which I think is great. Um, that I, I won't say that they're not slammed with uh, with people trying to get a hold of them, but I, I've been lucky. They, they've interacted with mm -hmm. me and I think that's great. Um, I would like to do the same uh, one day for someone else. Maybe someone else is, a, is an aspiring author. Maybe something I write will be famous. Maybe somebody will make a movie or not. I don't know, or show. Who knows? But I will always try and... Uh, give that uh, back like they did because I was in uh, that position at one point. So I think it's it's good if you can give back. Good luck. It, and this could it, be an amazing you know. movie. Uh, well, movie, TV series, it, it's, I, I don't know. It, it, I, I would take anything. I think uh, there, there's a lot to tell. So with a very complex, you know, hundreds of pages of, of, of uh, novel, maybe a two-hour movie wouldn't be the right format. Maybe a, maybe a, a, um, a five series or six, would be great. Five or six part TV series or something. Then you can really delve into to, to the parts and everything. But anything would, would be great. I think uh, even a movie of the week or, or something like that, you know, if, if somebody wants to pick it up like that, that's great because then people will discover that media and then want to go and read the book. And so they'll do it in, in mm -hmm. reverse order, which I think is terrific as an author, because as an author, you want readers. Uh, mm -hmm. Readers will drive sales and then that will inspire you to keep writing. And uh, at least that's what the what the game plan is. But thank you for saying that because I've, more than one person have said that this would make a, a neat movie or a TV series or something like that. Because it is shown, there are multiple points of view. It's a- uh, oh, yeah. uh, it's non-linear. Uh, there are flashbacks and things, and there's a lot of pieces that fit together and things that come together in, in a neat manner. And so I think uh, telling that in a, in a format that would take its time, so to speak, would be preferred. But if somebody wants to pay me a lot of movie to, to, to buy the rights to make a, a two-hour movie, they, I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> well, you saw how much I like it. It's the profile picture on my main book page. Mm -hmm. It's in the clock. Yes. Yes, I do uh, very much appreciate that. And uh, supporting fellow indie authors, and I try to do the same thing with their projects and everything, is, is very heartening to me because, uh, the you know, the whole selection is indie authors. Mm -hmm. of, of that one profile picture, all of them are indie authors. Yeah, absolutely. That's terrific. I mean, that's, that's uh, uh, what, what better way to, 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 to give thanks than to, to, to pay it forward like that and to, and to celebrate. Uh, fellow indie authors because you know we've got a tough i mean we, we, we it's not oh, easy you know, we no. have to do everything i mean th there's there's literally nothing that uh that we don't do i mean we're we're like uh ceo all the way down to janitor we do we have to do all the jobs as a as an independent author um oh, do yeah. everything. so it's it's not easy we make we may contract out for things. I'm not an artist and I have a lot of artist friends and they'll help me out with things like book covers and graphics and things like that. But at the end of the day, um, it, it's, it, it's a team of one. So getting oh, yeah. help friends and family and, and fellow authors, all of that helps tremendously. So thank you for that. Speaking of, well, you do have help. You do have the amazing Nancy and she is help spoil you with tea choices oh my gosh tea which I, one I, is your favorite oh my gosh that's uh that's a tough question it's like do you have a favorite kid um i will say that there are some teas that i go back to time and time again how about that and so okay. i'll start at the moment um i'll start my day with a delicious cup of uh, it's a british tea called pg tips actually i okay. learned that from folks that live in England, didn't know about uh, this tea, but uh, it's it's delicious. It's just sort of a plain black tea. It doesn't really have uh, a flavor profile like maybe like an Earl Grey mm -hmm. or a, you know you know uh, you know like a green tea or something like that. It's just a good strong black tea. I'll start with that. Then I'll move into uh, a the uh, uh, Republic of Teas Earl Grayer. This is a uh, a decaf version of Earl mm -hmm. Grey. I've I've done both, but 
I'm trying to limit my caffeine intake to at least the first uh, cup of the day to kind of kickstart me. After that, I'll try to move into either herbal tea or, or non-caffeinated decaffeinated tea. So their decaf Earl Grayer is really fantastic. It tastes in exactly like the real thing. You get all the flavor profiles of the bergamot and the, and, and the, just it's got a unique profile that, that's really good. At the moment, I'm drinking this uh, Tazo. Uh, I don't know if you can see this. It's a refreshment. It's a yes. green tea, really refreshing. Um, so I'm having that at the moment. And I've got this, uh, I'll just pick it up here. I've got one of these carafes. They're like $30. They hold like uh, 72 ounces of hot water and it holds it uh, in, in a boiling state for hours and hours. So I can just on demand. That is awesome. Pour myself a new cup of tea at any time of the day. And I, I, there are some days I'll go through two of those carafes in a day, just drinking tea. So that I've rocks. got lots of, it, it, I've got tea. Nancy does spoil me. I've got tea in every room. Uh, I'm never more than a few feet from, from tea. And I've, I'll try it. And, and I, I really do like everything. I, I can't think of a single tea flavor that I don't like. There are some that I may go back to more than others, but I'll try anything. Uh, they're all really, really good. And I've uh, asked on Twitter, uh, especially folks that live in Scotland and England, hey, what are your favorites? And for instance, PG tips that I didn't know about, I can get it at the local store here, which I think is great. That is awesome. Yeah, not I'm bad. I'm going to have to so look it up. PG tips is really good. I follow them on Twitter. They've actually retweeted some of my stuff. I'll, I'll post pictures of me drinking it and they, they like that and re, they'll retweet it. So they're, they're, that's pretty cool. That is awesome. Yeah. She is a superhero. Uh, she is a superhero. And I, uh, I laud and, 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 and will tell anyone that will listen into her. They're sick of listening, how great she is. And I'm very, very blessed and, and uh, humbled to, to, to be able to do what I do. Uh, because of her so oh yes yeah. i can tell from twitter how much you love that woman okay um yeah. okay uh you i get we should probably move on <laughs> yeah, no worries you, you can start i don't i didn't mean to to, to, to no. say the fourth was a problem it'll no. cut off you can start a new one maybe it'll just be part two it says no just it just keeps it, it I don't know if it's my internet or your internet. I was waiting for a second for you to come back on. <laughs> oh, I it you, it looks good to me. I didn't know okay, if, it was, cool. if it's uh, it, it had paused on my side for a second. Okay. I was waiting for you to come back and I'm like, okay, I can hear it. We can move on. No I apologize. Worries. Um no what uh okay. You said the important an important question you should be asked is how do you process and deal with negative book reviews. Will you tell your audience about why and how you deal with how you deal with the negative book reviews? Oh, absolutely. Uh, if you're a new author or even if you're an existing one, you're going to get lots of reviews, which is a good thing because that means people are buying and reading your book. Uh, any author would say that they want good reviews. Obviously, it, we're human beings. We crave positive feedback. If you give me a positive feedback, you say, hey, John, I really loved your book. I'm going to thank you and say, uh, thanks for buying it. Thanks for reading. I'll answer any of your questions, but I'll, I'll be very thankful. If for some reason the book wasn't for you, I will do exactly the same thing. So I've had people, even people that I follow and interact with on Twitter, believe it or not, that say in their review, this book is well written, but it just wasn't for me, or I just couldn't get into it, or I couldn't, you know, you know, do whatever, you know, it's, it's, it's not a glowing positive review. But then again, um, if you get uh, a few dozen or a couple hundred reviews, it, it, your book is not going to be for everyone. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be the most popular book in the okay. world. Look at any author out there. Stephen King, uh, for instance, you're going to see hundreds of one-star reviews for his stuff. That's because he's getting tens of thousands of reviews, but no book is going to be the, the, the catch-all and the be-all for everyone. So um, how do I deal with negative reviews? I deal, them, deal with them the exact same way I would do with a positive review. I'll thank the person for buying mm -hmm. and reading my book. I don't have any animosity because uh my book be for everyone so at the end of the day i'm not gonna uh, lose any sleep if somebody didn't like the book sorry uh, I'll, uh -huh. I'll maybe my next one will 
will will be good for them. Uh, if they certainly like my book, I'll I'll, I'll say the exact same thing. I'll, I'll I'll you know I'll be very thankful, but um, I don't let negative reviews bother me because I know going in that my book isn't going to be for everyone. So oh yeah, um, if they find some error with it, I'll try to correct it. If they just uh, are being a troll or a jerk or something like that, even more reason not to, to not to let that bother you. They're just looking for a reaction. If you don't give them that reaction, or if you just say thank you for your input and and move on, that's about the best thing you can do. It's not going to feed the the troll, so to speak. Um, okay. But but at the end of the day, we're human beings. If, if somebody just really just doesn't like my book, that's fine. They're entitled to uh, to to their opinion, and 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 that's fine. So that's how I deal with reviews. A lot of people may take them personally. We're all human beings. It's that's a natural response. But uh, certainly, I would advise if you're an author, don't don't lose any sleep over mm-hmm. it. Don't uh, don't keep it up. Uh, don't let it keep you up late. Don't don't obsess on it. Um, thank the person and and move on. And concentrate mm-hmm. on the ones that really liked your book because those are the folks that are going to come back and read your next one. So. Oh yeah. Yeah. Can you hold on just a minute? Yeah. I'm going to pause the recording and we're going to no end and restart. Okay. That'll work. That'll work. Yep. That'll work. Okay. We're back. Okay. In true Kelly Lynn Colby fashion, I really love her. Can zombies climb? You know, I saw this question on the on little cheat sheet you gave me for this interview. And I tried to look that person up and I saw they're on Twitter. I don't know if I'm following them. Maybe I did follow them because I wasn't following them before. I may need you to help me um, kind of explain. Okay. Many of her books and her follow, well, not her books, but her followers and authors and different people in the chat either have written zombie books or like zombie movies or zombie books. Zombies okay. in general. And everybody yep. has an opinion on zombies. <laughs> that's funny the opinion um, can be i don't like them or they can be a good opinion but in your opinion with everything you've watched or have read can zombies climb okay perfect uh i i have seen uh i'm not a big reader of uh zombie books i actually believe it or not on my desk i'll just reach over because uh this is quite apropos i have read Max Brooks' is uh-huh. World War Z. It's a great book. I was actually studying that book uh, because I think he's got a, an interesting format for the way he was uh-huh. telling a story. It was an interview type process where he has a journalist who was interviewing people after the fact about this giant zombie apocalypse. It's a great book. It, it goes into a uh-huh. whole lot of detail. I thought the movie was okay. Um, maybe they could have done a series uh, a tv series or something that would have given it more time versus you know this two-hour format where you try to squeeze in a bunch of things but uh if to answer your question if what i know of zombies comes from world war z and then i've watched uh, a few seasons of walking dead uh can zombies climb i think they can do anything that a person uh could do theoretically and in fact in world war z they had a a, a scene where um they were climbing on top of each other to uh-huh. get to a, uh, a certain goal or they, to do something. Um, I thought that was interesting because maybe there's some kind of hive mind thing going on. It's not that they're totally mindless. They were actually uh, working with one another, another to, to achieve a goal. So can, can zombies climb? I think they can. Um, uh-huh. I certainly w- wouldn't want them climbing anywhere near me or no. towards me. But uh, no, I think they can do anything a regular person can do. Maybe they can even do more because, uh, you know, they've got different rules. Uh, for instance, the zombies mm-hmm. in uh, Max Brooks' uh, uh, seminal work, uh, they're undead, I guess is the right term. And mm-hmm. so you can come across them. In fact, there was a, a scene I still remember where they came across uh, as part of the apocalypse. People died in their cars. There were these huge long lines of cars stuck out on a on a, on a freeway type situation and there were zombies still literally seat belted in dead and they were still trying to interact they couldn't get out of the car for some reason and so they were stuck in the car maybe because it was locked or they can't unlock themselves or whatever but they were still in their seat belt and they were undead and they were doing this for a very long time so they were sort of decomposing and they were they were still alive but they couldn't help themselves to get out of the car so, 
I'm gonna definitely have to check out this. Um, if they were climbing, that would mean they were. Yeah, they they were free, and maybe if they're free, that's not 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 a good thing to have a free zombie coming after you. But uh, I, I, again, crazy. I don't know what the rules are. I think um, I think there are maybe some accepted uh, uh, things if you're writing zombie-like stories. Uh, that, that, that if you deviate, then maybe it's not a zombie story, or, or maybe you invent your own thing, or maybe Max Brooks uh, made it up. I don't know. But uh, these zombies, at least in his um, case, and in the, the case of The Walking Dead, they're, they're already undead. They don't die. So if you don't eat or anything, if they're just hanging around somewhere in a locked room, they're going to be there for a very long time. And yeah. uh, they, they don't die just because they're not drinking water, or eating food or something. They're already dead. So the, the only way to stop them would, I believe, is something to do with the brain. They have to have their brain uh, uh, taken out. But otherwise, they're going to keep coming. In fact, in, in uh, Max Brooks' book, uh, they, they can the parts of the zombie can still be animated and not connected together, which is kind of creepy. So, yeah, I yeah. think they can climb, and I, I wouldn't want them anywhere near me. Definitely don't want to play with zombies. It is not no, no. anything. Not fun. No. Okay. No bites, nothing, nothing, nothing like that. <laughs> no. Okay, time to switch up the questions again, because sure. I'm just, my brain jumps. Your book has no inspired me to look up places in Russia to have a better idea of what it looks like. I have found videos of people in the area era of your book. Mm -hmm. Was inviting people to look up and learn more uh, a part of your intention of writing Stalin's door? Uh, I... To be honest, I probably wasn't thinking that when I was researching and writing, and I was actually just uh, heads down, uh, focused on on getting it out and and writing it, and then researching it and writing some more, and then I went into this you know, very long protect, protracted period of editing, which was a whole nother nightmare. Um, I don't think I honestly was thinking about my readers at that point, but that said, now that it's out there in the world and it's been up for for a little bit, uh, I am heartened when folks like yourself or others uh, come to me saying, hey, this is a really cool story. Is it real? I, I did some looking up. I, I did some, you know, light research and stuff and everything's tracking. You know, where, where can I find out more? Or, or what would you recommend I read next? Or, hey, I want to delve in and, and, and do the, the research you did. You know, what, what books helped you along the way? Or, or what would you recommend to, to, to go and watch or something like that? So I think that's great. If any historical fiction um, piece inspires its reader to actually go and learn about that period outside of what was written, which is fiction, but with the rules of historical fiction, you can't deviate too far from that mm -hmm. uh, known facts, or it becomes historical fantasy, or it just becomes fiction. And there's nothing wrong with that. If you want to write a book where uh, Stalin was the first baseman at uh, and played for the New York Yankees, yeah, go ahead and do that. It's going to really deviate from the known historical facts, um, but that doesn't mean it's any less of a good story. It could be a great story. It might be the next. Now uh, there's a picture of the different rulers of Russia on the diamond playing baseball. Be a great story. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. That would be either just fiction or historical fantasy. But if you want to write historical fiction, you kind of have to stay within certain rules. So if you're writing about World War II, there's an obvious uh, 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 winners and losers in World War II. Uh, if you want to write alternative uh, fiction or, or, or alternative history, uh, you know, then the Japanese win World War II. Or, or the Germans were in World War II and, 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 and America loses. There are lots of books like that. Or if you want to say World War I um, never happened, you know, you, you can deviate. You can do whatever you want as a writer. But if you want to do write good historical fiction, you have to stay within the known facts of, of, of history. And so, yeah, Joseph Stalin was a real person. He ruled Russia for many years. You know, these are known things. Certain things happened when he was uh, the, the, the leader of, of the uh, USSR. And... You, you need to, to stick to those known facts. Of course, everything in the book that I am writing with the exception of Stalin, those are made up characters, but they fit well within the events of, of what happened. Oh yeah. So, yeah. It was a very interesting seeing it from their point of view. Absolutely. And I, and I love it when people come and say, hey, you've inspired me to, to, to go and learn more about this subject. Cause I think it's pretty esoteric. I mean, I don't think it's, it's uh, tremendously well known um, mm -hmm. at, at least over here. So maybe if you grew up in Russia, you know, that would be a different story. But uh, at least for um, 
people in the U.S., I think it's it's not as known as as it could be. Okay. Um, yeah. Where do you like to uh, go and relax? And I like to go and relax. Do you like I to run away question. to a place or? Yeah. yeah. You know. Yeah. A couple. Um, one that I've been to probably twenty times. I, I live in Northern Virginia, so that's a a Washington D.C. suburb. We're you know like thirty miles outside of the nation's capital. So northern part of Virginia, but if you go a little bit southwest of here, uh, it's about a nine hour flight. There's a city in western uh, North Carolina, Asheville, Asheville, North Carolina. It's sort of a, uh, a beer centric. Uh, they, they call it the Portland of the East. Actually, that's a misnomer because I think they actually might have more breweries per capita than Portland does, but they certainly are well known for their arts uh, and craft uh, community and they're very well known for for brewing craft beer i mean they have uh, more breweries there than anywhere else and that so is you amazing. Like craft beer you can go hang out with artists and uh people that 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 that, that, that are writers or or crafts people or or people that make things um you know there's a there's a huge community down there of uh independent artists and they like to drink beer because a lot of people make beer down there and so I've been to Asheville probably 20 times. I like going down there. It's, it's, it's just a, a nice, uh, relaxing place to get away. It's a small town. There's a lot of tourists, obviously. In fact, they're, it's funny. They're, they have a, uh, a single A team, baseball team, whose uh, mm-hmm. team name is the tourists. The Asheville tourists is, is their team name. I think they're a, a, a Braves um, farm team. But uh uh, so they, they were getting tourists before the, the, the craft beer industry took over. For instance, mm-hmm. if you're familiar with the Biltmore, the, uh, the estate, that's in Asheville. Mm-hmm. So that's okay. that, that estate's over 100 years old. That was from the, the Rockefellers. And there's a huge um, estate you can go and visit. Uh, but there's lots of things to do in Asheville. It's quiet. It's friendly. Uh, we love going down there. And we've been down there uh, uh, 20 times and we'll continue to keep going there. Hell, maybe, maybe we'll retire there. I don't know. Uh-huh. It would be, would be really cool. So that, that's a place we like to go to. Okay. That sounds amazing. And it we does. It's a, definitely have to out. let Kelly Lynn Colby I would, know. I would recommend Asheville to anyone. It's a great, great community. Okay. Do you have a place in your home you like to chill? Well, yeah, you'll see uh, on Twitter occasionally post uh pictures uh i can tag locations and i made one uh, a a while ago or at at least it's on twitter now maybe it sucked it in from something else but we have a room nancy and i have a room in our house we call it the nook and okay kind of like the book reader i think for barnes and noble but we had called this long before that it's uh it's a a basement uh kind of rec room type situation we got a couple easy chairs got a tv in there there's a fireplace there's a there's a, a a futon which people can sleep on if they stay over. Um, we just like to hang out in the nook. You know, we can read there, or we can watch TV, or you know. Okay, that uh, sounds awesome. With Grover, Grover's got a bed in there. Um, I, I've got, uh, uh, like I said, easy chairs. There's, it's just, it's, it's a uh, just a nice rec room type situation. We just go hang out there, and uh, that's what we call the nook. And so if you if you see me in the house here, I'll probably if I'm not in my office, I'll be in the nook. Just, that sounds awesome. Out, yeah, it's really just nice, relaxing uh, uh, place. So, okay. Um, yeah. What is your favorite thing about finding new books on Twitter? My favorite thing about finding new books on Twitter is probably interacting with those authors writing those new books. And so now that I am, uh, I think, pretty well established in the tw- Twitter writing community, i.e., uh, I've got lots of people that I consider friends and I interact with them, uh, I am more than happy to read their books, uh, review their books, uh, promote their books. And then it seems like everybody but me is writing a series. Um, they'll write a book. It'll be very successful. Then they're going to write book two and then they'll write book three. I know a dozen people that are doing that right now. And so um, I like to continue to uh, see how their stories evolve and continue to promote their uh, books that they have coming out, which I think is really neat. And it's totally organic. Um, I, I don't, uh, do it for anything other than the love of supporting uh, those authors. And I 
I have seen that that love will come back to me because they'll read and support and promote my stuff as well. So it's a, it's a sort of a symbiotic, mutually beneficial uh, 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 situation where um, if you interact with and promote and read uh, their works, they're going to do the same for you. And that, and that's really a, a good way to build engagement, to find new readers, um, to get recommendations. You'll see these posts where somebody will just come in and say, Hey, uh, Twitter reading community or writing community, you know, these recommendations. They will be slammed with a hundred replies saying, hey, read my book or read my friend's book or read this new book I just read uh, from this new author I discovered. Um, give mm -hmm. us some love or her some love. I think that's terrific. So that, that's a great thing about Twitter. It's very interactive. It's for me, for all of social media, I know there's a lot of things out there. There's Instagram, there's Facebook, there's, I'm not on TikTok. I spend probably more time on Twitter than anything else because at least for me, the rewards and the interaction are more uh, than any other platform that I'm on at the moment. Mm -hmm. So you're going to find me on Twitter more than anywhere else. Doesn't mean I'm not on those other platforms. Well, I'm not on TikTok, but uh, I'm on uh, Instagram and Facebook. And um, I just don't spend as much time there because the way that Twitter is set up is the interaction is, is a lot more um, uh, instant than some of these other platforms. I mean, oh, yeah. You can ask a question and within uh, seconds, you can get a reply uh, to, to, a, to a question or a post or, or a problem or something like that. It doesn't mean you can't do it on all these other platforms, but for instance, Facebook, you have to be friends with someone first before you interact with them. Twitter, you can just interact with anyone. So, oh, yeah. um, and, and they can choose to interact with you or they can just choose to block you or ignore you. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's whatever they want, but, but you're in uh -huh. control of, of that arrangement. So if there's someone you just don't want to follow them, then don't follow them. And if oh, somebody's yeah. bugging you, you can block them. Um, but you don't have to be friends with them first to interact with them, which you do on Facebook. So the arrangement's just a little bit different. I think it's much easier to find and interact with new authors on Twitter than anywhere else that I'm oh, aware yeah. of. Yep. Definitely an easy platform to go through. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. Time for the last question. <laughs> last question. After okay. all the insanity of trying to figure out platforms, we have finally. I am so grateful. Okay. Yeah. Where can your readers find you? Oh my gosh. The easiest place for this time. And I, I know this might be viewed in the future. So, you know, today is August 15th, 2022. At least for today, the easiest most expedient and, and, and fastest way you're going to get me and get a response from me is on Twitter mm -hmm. at you, you Saint, just put at you, you Saint in there. You can send me a DM. You can send me a post, do whatever. I, I, I try my best to interact with everything that is asked of me. And at least at, at this point in time, um, I'm spending the majority of my time when it comes to book promotion and, and finding and interact with authors there. So if you go to Twitter, uh, you can find me pretty, pretty quickly and interact with me pretty easily. So it doesn't mean you can't do it on Facebook. I have a Facebook author page there. You can do that on Instagram too, or you can write me a letter or email mm -hmm. or whatever, but Twitter, you'll get a, a pretty quick response, I think. So okay. that's the easiest. I'm going to continue using Twitter until something else is better. How about that? That works. I'm not going to tell you not to. I just don't know how to do one of these videos on there. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I, uh, I've done these uh, interviews before and I only recommended Zoom because someone else did it. Our yeah. book club is on Zoom. Um, I've done ones on, it was a YouTube guy had his mm -hmm. own YouTube channel and he could record there. I've done on Facebook and I know so I'm on a Mac. Maybe the, the stuff isn't compatible as we found out because, you know, Jen and mm -hmm. I spent at least an hour trying to get uh, things working and we couldn't get it working. But um, I don't think, uh, although I say the Mac may, may not have made it easier, uh, it probably can't be completely blamed. I, I'm blaming Facebook on that because I tried three different browsers and it just didn't want to work with us. Right. Didn't want to work for the first two. And one of those was the default Mac one. So I, I don't know what to say on that. But, but this works. Zoom has been good. Yeah, it's worked. Yeah. We have an interview. Thank you so we much. Oh, no worries. Happy to do this again, Jenny. I wanted to say thank you for reading my book multiple times for giving me great feedback, for leaving me those reviews, for promoting my book, and for being a great uh, presence on, on Twitter and Facebook and all of the things that you're working on. And I'm happy to return the favor. 
And I do really thank you for taking the time to come up with creative questions that you can ask me that I can tell you and then have other people listen in uh, to at a later date. Okay. So I really appreciate yes. that. I'm going to go put it all over social media. And awesome. I hope you have a blessed day. And please tell the, your superhero wife, thank you for being amazing. <laughs> and thank you for yes. being here. No worries. Thank you, Jenny. I really appreciate the opportunity. And thank you so much. Okay. Bye.